Good morning, everybody. Everybody still awake? Let's see. Uh, I'll ha I have a lot of demos, um, so there should be kind of some interaction in there. Um, so, can I have some slides, please? Maybe. Otherwise, the demos will be very hand wavy. So, I will talk about the, the revolution part, which will be very short, and we'll then mainly um, spend time on the evolution, like what has happened in the past few versions. Okay. I did not touch any cables. Hey. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so, this is my official role. Um, the developer advocate. I mostly do conferences, meetups, and just speak about the, the stuff that we do as a company. Um, if you have any questions um, and you either forget or you don't want to ask in public, come to me afterwards or just use Slido. Um, just throw in any questions there. Um, if I have time at the end, I will answer them on stage. If I don't, I will tweet out the answers. So slido.do um, slash my Twitter handle is where you can just answer or add any questions, and I'll try to add them or answer them at the end. Um, so, starting with the revolution, um, what was the revolution like? Where are we? Um, I use uh, dbengines.com to say, like, okay, this is where we are with data stores today. Who knows that site? Okay, that is a surprisingly small number. Um, so, they have, like, the Tioba index for programming languages. They do the same thing for data stores. So, they basically have a ranking you can always argue and discuss is this the right ranking or how should this be uh, for data stores. And currently, it looks something like this. So you can see the relational databases are still on top, but MongoDB is the top NoSQL data store, and Elasticsearch is now on number eight. Uh, we're pretty happy about that. So that was kind of the revolution. And I guess everybody is familiar with what Elasticsearch is. I, I will spare you any introduction. Um, by the way, the only system I think should not be in there is the one right below Elasticsearch, which is Access. Um, and I, I don't think this should be on any proper data store list, but it's still number nine. And we are very happy that we have finally overtaken Access, because that was kind of one of the goals we really wanted to achieve over time. And probably it can fade out somewhere. Okay. Coming to the evolution, what is kind of what are the trends? What are we trying to do? What are we updating and doing? So the first thing is about strictness, which is basically when you are a young project, you want to be very forgiving and you want to be easy to use, and people just get started. When you are getting more mature, um, you kind of want to avoid bad stuff because bad stuff is not that bad when you are in development, but it will be very bad in production afterwards. So we would rather fail early and be kind of a pain early on than have like, that big outage afterwards. So what we have is we have these bootstrap checks. Did anybody run into bootstrap checks and had issues with those? One, not that many. We have some of these checks. Uh, these are just things where we know this will break at some point in production, probably. And we will not start up a node if you're in a clusterable uh, state. And we will actually fail the node immediately and will not let it come up. And I can actually show that. Um, I have three Docker containers running, and one of them is badly configured. And you can see here I have an Elasticsearch one node, and this is the actual bootstrap check that has failed. And you can see here, um, so on the top line, uh, you can see we bound to a non-local host interface, and that's when we assume this is production mode. You could form a cluster. Um, if you're just binding to localhost, we assume you're in development mode, and we will just issue a warning. We will tell you, OK, this might need fixing, but we will still let you continue. As soon as you're in a clusterable state, we will actually fail the node because we saw something that is not right. For example, here, uh, you can see the bootstrap check failed, and we did not activate memory locking, even though we requested that in the configuration. And after that, Elasticsearch just stops. We actually stop the node. You're not able to use it. Um, let's quickly fix that. Um, so I have explicitly uh, commented out these memory locking settings. Um, let's quickly kill the node. I will show you my Docker setup while uh, the nodes are actually coming up again. So let's 
basically what I have here is I have three Elasticsearch nodes. Um, this is one of these three Elasticsearch nodes that you can see. So it has the name Elasticsearch 1. Um, I use um, some version in the background. Um, so right now I'm using 5.6.9. We'll do a live upgrade to the upcoming 6.3 version. Um, so I have set some settings, um, basically the usual stuff. Um, since it's just my laptop, it's half a gig of heap. Um, and then I have the same setting for the node 2 and node 3. Um, the one thing that you might need afterwards uh, or that we come back to is that I bind. So Elasticsearch is on port 9200. I will, I'm binding Elasticsearch 1 binds to 9201, Elasticsearch 2, 9202, and 3 to 9203. And then I have Kibana running as well just to make the interaction a bit easier. And then I have my data volumes, and that's it. So this is my entire setup. And if you're lucky, um, it has um, started up uh, in the background already. Uh, that's not what I wanted. Um, so. OK, it's still starting up. And probably somewhere in here, we have all the nodes started, hopefully, at some point. Let's see. Because there should not be any login. OK, cool. We have Elasticsearch um, 5 running. Let's make that slightly larger. Is that large enough for everybody to read? Or let's simply change the font setting a bit. OK, so we have the latest version of 5.6 running. Um, you can see we have three nodes all together. Um, so we have Elasticsearch 1, 2, 3. Elasticsearch 3 is the master node right now. And my cluster is green and healthy. So let's go back to strictness. Um, the one strictness that we had were our bootstrap checks. The other one are that we're now checking configurations and parameters. And if you have any typos in there in previous versions, if you had a typo, we would simply ignore that typo and ignore that parameter, which made debugging very hard. Because even for us, it was hard. You have a 100-line configuration file. You have a typo somewhere, and we'll simply ignore that parameter. This is probably not what you, you want. Uh, by now, we'll also fail. If your configuration is bad, we will fail the startup process. Uh, or if you have a parameter that we don't recognize, uh, we will actually tell you instead of ignoring it. Does anybody see the typo here? What is missing in that command? Yes, there is a, an E missing here in type. So if you run that, it will actually tell you, OK, illegal argument. I don't know what you're trying to do. Um, but it will actually try to help you out. So you can say, this is what you typed. And then it says, um, well, maybe you meant this. Um, thanks to the Levenstein distance, we can very easily guess what might be a similar command. If you're using git on a command line, you're seeing something similar where it will suggest, oh, you mistyped status or whatever. Uh, maybe you meant this other command. Um, so if you correct that. Your command will then work as expected. This is one of the changes that we added in 5.0 already, just to fail early, be a bit more of a pain in the beginning, but make um, your life afterwards a bit easier. The next one are rolling upgrades that we have added. This was one of the main point, pain points people had, because as soon as you had a major version upgrade, basically you would shut down the entire cluster, update all the nodes, then update all the installations, and then hope that your cluster would come back up. For some people, downtime was acceptable. For a lot of people, downtime was not really acceptable. Uh, we are trying to work around that. And we support rolling upgrades now, which probably feel a bit like this. Um, and you hope that your little train is not derailing while you're riding it. And you just hopefully keep going and keep going. And we'll actually try to do that live now. So I will need these three documents uh, with three different types. We will need them afterwards. So I will insert them now. Um, we'll come back to those. Um, what we're doing first is uh, we want to check how is my cluster doing. Can I even upgrade? And for that, in 5.6, so the latest version of the 5 branch, we have added this upgrade assistant. And that upgrade assistant will first tell you, um, back up your indices now. I will not do that. But please, for your production use case, don't skip the warning. Um, or don't blame us that you have lost all your data. Um, so back up your data if you have any meaningful data in there. Um, then we have a checker, which will basically tell you, OK, we have one error. We could go to the documentation to actually fix that. Uh, but we also have a helper, which can do that for you. So basically, you can see here my .kibana index, something in our configuration format changed. Um, if I re-index that, it will basically create that in the right format for me. Um, 
and then I can do my upgrade. So if I head over to my cluster check, you can see now I just have notes. I don't even have errors or warnings. Now I can actually do my upgrade. So what we want to do now is um, we want to basically rotate out one node by the, the other. So what I need to do is in my environment file, um, I want to command out 5.6, and I want to switch that over to 6.3, which will be released soon. But yeah, we like to test stuff, and um, I'll just try to test the upcoming release here as well. So um, basically, I'm killing Elasticsearch 3 and replace it by a 6 version of the same node. Since this was the master node, it might take some time until the cluster figures out, oh, OK, the master is gone. I need to uh, vote for a new master. Then the Elasticsearch 3 node will come back up. Um, you can actually see somewhere pretty much at the end now, probably you can see that Elasticsearch 3 has exited somewhere if I would see it. So here you can see we have killed Elasticsearch 3. Um, it has exited here in that closed statement, basically. Um, we have killed that node. Um, the cluster keeps running. And hopefully, it has already elected a new um, master node. And it was quick enough that it has actually joined. And this now looks very simple. But this is like a big change from what we had in previous versions. You can see we have mixed major version numbers. We have two nodes on 5.6 and one node on 6.3 already. And you can still um, query your data and keep doing whatever you have been doing or want to do with your cluster. So let's quickly um, do the same thing for the other two nodes. So you can see, OK, we have killed another node. Um, Elasticsearch 1 is now the master node. Um, Elasticsearch 2 is currently being replaced. You can keep reading and also writing your data. Um, and while I'm talking, it will take about, I don't know, 20 seconds or something like that until my node comes back up, um, hopefully. You can also watch it live. Um, here you can see Elasticsearch uh, 2 is starting. It's bound to a public interface. It is in the state started. So it should join my cluster any moment now. And it is back. So we can actually do the same thing for Elasticsearch 1. Before I do that, um, let me quickly cheat and copy out one curl command. So I'm killing my Elasticsearch 1. What will happen to Kibana? It's erroring out. Why is that? Because Kibana right now can only talk to a single Elasticsearch instance. And I have set that to. Elasticsearch 1. So for now, we will need to fall back to the command line. So basically, I do I run the same command with curl just to say, like, OK, give me all the nodes and what we have. So we can see Elasticsearch 3 is now the new master node, um, and Elasticsearch 1 is still starting up and trying to join. And now it has actually come back up. The one thing that we still need to replace is Kibana. And for those of you who have ever complained about Java taking a long time to start up, wait until that node process comes up, because that will be the slowest thing here. This will be like a minute or so while I kind of need to keep talking. Uh, nothing is happening because, well, there is nothing there. So yeah, nothing is reachable. Uh, and in the background, somewhere, uh, my little node process, OK, it has exited, but it will try to climb up again, and it will yeah, it, it will take a while until um, Kibana is back up. But we have live migrated. You can still run your queries right now. Your cluster is in a healthy state already. Uh, so no downtime upgrades anymore. Um, everything worked out pretty much as expected. Um, while Kibana is coming up, let's talk about the next topic, and I'll show you that Kibana is up afterwards. Watermarks. Who is aware of mo watermarks? Quick show of hands. OK, not everybody. Um, so we have various watermarks. Um, normally, when you don't see stuff or stuff is overflowing, bad stuff might happen. And you basically want to stop from falling over if there is flooding. So we had the first two, the low and the high watermark, we had in previous versions. Low basically meant um, stop allocating new shards if you have hit more than 85% of disk space usage. And if you're at 90%, actually actively try to migrate shards away from that node if you have space anywhere else. Now, we have added a new high flood stage or flood stage watermark um, for at 95% default values, which will basically block write operations. So if you have 5% or less of disk space left, we will actively reject your write operations. You can still read data. You can delete data. But rather than writing data and probably being not able to write it everywhere or write it in the right way or corrupting your data somewhere, we will just reject your write operations entirely. 
Um, so ideally, <coughs> Kibana has came, come back up now. And yes, looks like we're in luck today. Um, I don't want to send statistics now. Um, so um, by the way, um, the coloring scheme changed. If you've never seen Kibana 6, um, I always say 4 was black. No, sorry, 3 was black, 4 was white, 5 was colorful, 6 is blue. Um, why blue? Because it's easier to read if you're colorblind. Like the colorful stuff was not very good for colorblind people. Um, but now it should be better. So um, yeah, we're on 6.3, the upcoming version, which should come out very soon. Uh, let's hope we don't find any more blockers. Um, and well, we've upgraded all the nodes. Um, that should all be fine. Back to our three nodes. So let's head over to the flood stages. I create a new index, which I call my flood, and I insert one document. And afterwards, I check how much disk space do I have in my containers. And you will see here um, we have 30.1 gig of uh, disk space available here in total and 24 gigs free. Um, I will actually set, you can either set it to percent or an absolute value. So I will set my uh, watermarks to 150 and 30 gigs. So I will hit the flood stage watermark immediately. Um, immediately after I had this um, interval, uh, the, the update interval. So around every 10 seconds or so, we will check, did you hit any of the uh, flood stage uh, of the watermarks? And we'll then try to act accordingly. So now it should lock up my write operations immediately because, well, I only have 24 gigs of disk space available and I set that limit to 30 gigs. You can still read documents. This is, this is the document I've just inserted, um, but my write operation should be rejected because we've already hit the high uh, flood stage, uh, the flood stage watermark. And you can see this is exactly the error operation or the, the response that you will get. Um, index is read only and allows deletes. This is what all you can do. So, um, that works as suspected. Let's revert it. Um, I think it was version 5 where we added that if you want to reset something to the default value, you don't want to set a specific value, not even the, the value that is the default, but reset the value, you can actually set something to null now. This will revert um, all these three settings to the default settings. So 85, 90, and 95%. Um, we'll take some time to update. And once it has been updated, then I can run my write operations. Or can I? Is this expected that this fails? It is. It's maybe just a bit uh, not what you were expecting. Because once an index is locked, so once we had a shard and we tried to write to a shard where we hit the flood stage watermark, we will lock that index. And you currently need to manually unlock that index. So what you need to do is, uh, on the index my flood, you need to actually uh, set the read only allow delete to null as well so that you don't write to that anymore. And once you have reset that, now you can happily write to your index again. But you manually need to unset that. We might change it in the future, that we automatically we see you hit the, the flood stage watermark, and then you, we see, OK, there is more disk space now. We might unlock that automatically. We're not sure. What we want to avoid is that we have like a toggling state, where you at that 95% limit, and sometimes you can get a write in, and sometimes you cannot um, if you delete a few documents again, for example. Um, so um, we're not sure right now. There is no automatism. You will need to manually actually change and fix that. Sequence numbers. That was, that was one of the big things that we have added as well, because sometimes keeping track of what is going on is kind of hard. And sometimes you need more than your fingers to count. Um, so. Um, this is to show you how sequence numbers work. So you have a primary shard and two replica shards. We have a write operation zero, which is being replicated to my replicas. You have a local checkpoint, what you have locally written, and then you have these global checkpoints. So whenever you do a write operation uh, on the response, we will actually tell you, OK, we are at this local checkpoint, and then you can forward the global checkpoint. Uh, we basically piggyback on the request there. Um, you can see we're doing two write operations. If they're in the wrong order, we know that since they're a sequential number, only if we have all the writes, we can forward the local checkpoint and then tell the primary that we have received all the or replicated all the data and we can forward the uh, global checkpoint. Now my primary shard will die. And you can see write operation four and six has gone to replica two, and the new primary shard has not received that four operation. And basically, since it's the new primary, it will tell the other shard, well, roll back your fourth write operation, because I didn't see that. I'm setting what is kind of the real state. Throw it out, 
and now kind of my state is what you need to get. And then they will just sync up on all the, the sequence numbers and the transactions or the, the operations that you have had in between. So these are the sequence numbers that we have added to keep track of what is going on. Um, so sequence numbers look something like this. Uh, let's, do. let's say um, I'm creating a new index called sequences, uh, uh, sequence numbers with one primary shard, one replica shard, and I'm excluding the Elasticsearch one instance. Why am I excluding the Elasticsearch one instance? because Kibana is talking to it. And I will need to kill uh, nodes again. And otherwise, I will need to fall back uh, on the command line again, and I don't want that. Um, so these shards can be allocated to the Elasticsearch 2 and 3 nodes. Um, if we check that, uh, we can see um, we have the primary shard is Elasticsearch 3, and the replica shard is Elasticsearch 2. Remember that the primary shard is Elasticsearch 3. We will need that information in a few moments. Um, so now you can start inserting documents. And this looks very familiar, or at least this part here looks very familiar. This part here um, is what is new. The sequence number, um, let's insert a few more documents to see what is happening here. So you can see the sequence number is basically an increment for every operation, um, and the primary term that will change every time the primary shard changes. So we can keep track of who has received which write operations. We need both of these uh, counters. Um, you can write to one specific document, even if you do a, an update, since I'm writing to the same document ID here. Even if it's an update, it will uh, increment that number. If I delete that document, will it be another operation? Will my sequence number increment? Yes, it does. So I've deleted the document. What if I try to delete the document again? Will it still increment the sequence number? Guesses? Who says yes? Who says no? It does. Um, it doesn't change anything, but we are keeping track of all the right operations that we do. Um, OK, so what we will do now is, um, and we have kind of like the, basically, 3 was the primary shard. We will kill that node. And I think that was also the master node now by accident. So this is kind of the worst case scenario. We need to vote for another master node, and then the nodes need to figure out, OK, what data do I have? Where is my new primary copy? Um, what do I do here? So um, if you look at that, you probably see, OK, Elasticsearch 3 exited. And then my other nodes might be shortly confused, uh, but hopefully they will figure out what they need to do. So let's see. They're still trying to get a new uh, master node. So right now, they're in a slightly confused state. Let's see. There is a slight timeout for which we need to wait. Um, which was 30 seconds. Uh, you can see, OK, very scary stack traces, but this is kind of expected. Uh, they're figuring out that they need to vote for a new master node, and then they will also figure out that the primary shard is gone. So this might take, I don't know, a few more seconds, hopefully only. Um, this will repeat a few times uh, where Elasticsearch 1 and 2 will try to ping the master node the Elasticsearch 3 node. Um, and after a few pings, they give up, and then we'll elect a new master node between themselves. Um, so here you can see primary re replica resync. So they seem to have figured out that only those two are left now. Um, and you can see here they have not figured out that Elasticsearch 3 is actually gone. Um, that will take another few moments. Come on. Because right now, you would try to send your search request or your write operations to a shard that doesn't exist or is not part of the cluster right now. Um, it would time out. Then your client needs to handle that. Uh, but in a few moments, uh, now they have actually figured it out. And here you can see my primary shard now is the Elasticsearch 2 node. My replica shard is unassigned. Why is it unassigned? Basically, because it couldn't go anywhere else. Because Elasticsearch 3 is down. Why does it not go to Elasticsearch 1? Because we said explicitly that this index can only be go to Elasticsearch 2 and 3. Why does it not replicate to Elasticsearch 2? Because there is no point in having the replica on the same node. Um, so there is basically no place where this can uh, replicate. So um, what state will our cluster be in now? Yellow. Because all the data is there, you can read and write it. But you don't have all the replicas that you want to have in your cluster. And it will tell you in the cluster state that it's yellow. Um, now let's insert a few more documents. So uh, you can see my sequence number is counting up. And once we're satisfied with that, we can actually restart the Elasticsearch 3 node again. 
And well, it will take another 20 seconds or so. Um, let's keep doing some write operations. Um, after 20 seconds or whatever, um, Elasticsearch 3 will join the cluster again. Will that be a primary or a replica shard for this index now afterwards? A replica, because we don't change the primaries. Uh, it will see, okay, there is an existing primary shard, I will become a replica shard, and then it will try to sync up all the data that it missed. Um, so let's see. Okay, you can see it has joined again. We have the primary shard now is Elasticsearch 2, and the replica shard is Elasticsearch 3. So that worked as expected. And now to one of the very nice side effects of this. We have, um, bless you, we have here, based on the sequence numbers, uh, we have these trans log ops recovered. Basically, in previous versions, we were comparing the Lucene segments that we were writing. And since they were written independently, often these Lucene segments were slightly different. And then we had to replicate a lot of data, um, everything that was different on disk. With this transaction log that we have, we can basically just replay the missed out transactions. And here you can see Elasticsearch 2 replicated 18 changes to Elasticsearch 3 because those were the 18 changes that it missed while it was down, and it has uh, done those. So any recovery will be much more efficient now since we only need to replay um, those changes. Okay. No, we don't want to see that. Um, what do you think happens if we run out of sequence numbers? Do we have any mechanism to roll those over? We don't. Um, so our assumption is pretty much um, this is a long, and the long should be enough for pretty much forever. Also, um, because it's on a per shard level. And I can demonstrate that per shard level quite easily. So let's throw away the index that we have. Um, let's say we have 10 primary shards, one replica shard. Um, you can see lots of shards. Let's make this slightly smaller. So lots of shards. Um, and then you can do your write operations. For example, here I don't provide an ID, so it will go to any random shard because we will generate a random ID. And you can see, okay, sequence number 0, 0. At some point we will have a 1, and then it will fall back to 0 or 2 or whatever, since it is on a per shard level. So this is a write operation on a per shard level. Um, if you write to the same in a shard, because here I have a specific uh, ID, it will always hash to the same hash uh, for the routing information, so this will go to the same shard. So here we have a nicely incrementing uh, counter, basically, since it's always going to the same shard. Um, this is mainly a question coming from Postgres people, because they have this global transaction ID, which is an integer. And if you don't run auto vacuum on a frequent basis and it rolls over, you will not be able to do any write operations anymore. We don't really have that problem because um, if, I, if I calculated that correctly, with 2 to the power of 63, you're, if you do like a million write operations uh, per second, you still have something like 300,000 years on a per shard level or something like that. So this is not a real problem that you will run into. Um, we don't have any me mechanism to roll that over, but it will not happen. Or if it happens, something is very weird in your system. Um, there's one trade-off, however. We need to keep track of all these transactions. So this is, again, on a per shard level. Um, we will keep up to half a gig of transactions or up to 12 hours. So whatever hits first, we will throw out the data. But you will need to keep up to half a gig of disk space in addition to every single shard that you have on a server. So this is just more disk space that you might have, and you need to keep track of that so you won't run into, for example, the flood stage watermark at some point um, and be not allowed to write anymore. Um, and this will allow some more features. So we might, or we are currently trying to get to cross data center replication, where you have basically independent clusters in different regions, and we will just replay operations to another cluster. Since we have the transaction log, we can do that in an async fashion. We're just fixing some stuff in on or adding features we need on a Lucene level. And once we have those, we will add them in Elasticsearch. We're not sure about the version. Maybe some later 6.x version or sometimes in 7 only. But we're working on that, so that will come as well. Um, types are going away. Who knew that types are going away? Who, who is very surprised? OK. That is still one or two hands. Um, so first off, why are we getting rid of types? Um, Kind of because we lied, and okay, something is falling down. Um, why? Multiple types 
don't really exist on the Lucene level. And they have, like, if you have different types, you would assume they're kind of independent, but they're not, because for Lucene, they still map to the same field. So for example, if you have two different types and you have the field disabled on two of them, and you might think one of these fields is a Boolean because I disabled somebody, and the other field is a timestamp because that's when I disabled somebody. This will not work out because it needs to map to the same data type. Sparsity, even though improved in Lucene 7, is still not a great thing. And also scoring is not on a per type level, but within the index, which is kind of confusing. And the Elasticsearch team wanted to get rid of types for a long time. So what are we doing? In 5, you could opt into having a single type. In 6, by default, you can only have a single type anymore. You can change it in the configuration, but don't do that because it will only be more pain later on. Um, you can still use multiple types if you have imported data from five. That is why I have inserted those documents in the beginning. In seven, you cannot create multiple types anymore, and the type will actually be optional in the API. And in eight, basically, there are no more types. So this will take quite a few years, but this ensures that we don't have any breaking changes, and you don't have any major upgrading pains there. So um, what does this look like? You remember, I, I have created that index types with three different types. So you can see I have here uh, type 1, type 2, and type 3. And all of them have the ID 1, by the way, just to make it a bit more tricky. Um, now I want to create a new type with the underscore doc type, which is the one we recommend. In 6.0 and 6.1, we recommended doc without the underscore. We changed it. We are sorry. Um, use underscore doc now. Um, that is the one we recommend. Unfortunately, on 6.0 and 6.1, if you try to use the type underscore doc, it doesn't work. Um, go to 6.2 directly and then use underscore doc to avoid any upgrading pains around that. Um, we just figured out like underscore is normally what it, we use for internal stuff, so this is the one we want to use now. Though you can pick any type as long as there is only a single one. So I'm inserting one document with this type, then I try to insert another document with another type. What will happen? It will fail, of course. And it will actually tell me, you are trying to have two different types, which we don't allow. Um, how do you migrate your data? I mean, this requires, OK, you need to change the type. How do you migrate your data? data? I'm using the reindex API. I'm basically taking the data from the types index with multiple types and play it into the no types index. And then I'm changing with this script here. I'm saying the ID is a concatenation of the type and the ID. Since all my documents in the different types had the ID 1, I need the concatenation. I set the underscore type field, this internal one, to my custom field type. And then I set the underscore type field to underscore doc. And if I play that, it will actually take my three documents and put them into the no types index. And you can see I have all of them here. All of them have the type underscore doc. And you can see this one was the one I inserted directly. And these are the ones that I've replayed with this ID. And with a filter, you can get back to pretty much the same behavior that you have if you were, were using multiple types. You just need to have, well, the filter to filter down on the type one, for example, here. And then you get a single document back with that custom type field. Two kind of more op performance optimizations are, are uh, automatic queue resizing. We've added that, which is kind of clever. You can set my target response time for searches, for example, is two seconds. And Elasticsearch will figure out that right now it is serving 50 search requests per second. So your queue size is 100. Um, and if you try to add 100 first element, it will actually be rejected. And then your client can figure out, do I want to try a different node, or do I want to take some other action? But rather than queuing up re search requests for longer than those two seconds, or approximately two seconds then, um, we'll try to actively reject operations to have avoid that. The other one is adaptive replica selection. So right now, we are doing round robining between primary and any replica shards to do read operations. What we are, so it was added in 6.1, needs to be enabled explicitly. It will be. A on by default in 7, it's based on yeah, a funky paper. Um, what we're trying to do is basically we're figuring out, trying to figure out which is the least busy node, and then we'll try to go to that node. So we're not trying to go to a node that has already a very uh, queued up a lot of requests and might be slow, or that is, I don't know, experiencing some garbage collection. We'll just route, try to route around busy nodes and go to the less busy node for uh, faster requests. 
If you have a busy cluster, this will help a lot. If you have a not very busy cluster, the change is still not hurting you. Shrink and split. Those are two of the re uh, APIs that people have requested for a long time. Um, so, well, shrink is kind of obvious. You try to combine multiple shards together, um, which will look something or yeah, which will look something like this. So, I have a shrink index where I insert one document. Um, so you can see how many shards will I have? Five primary, five replica. Um, what I then say is I want to have one primary or shard, uh, replica shard on the Elasticsearch 3 node. Uh, so I'll make sure that I have at least one shard or one of the shards uh, on one node. And then, so if you show that, you could, we, we could see that uh, Elasticsearch 3 has now one copy each. And now I take my shrink index called the underscore shrink API and store the result in the shrunk index. Um, which only has one shard. And if you run that, uh, you can see now we only have two shards, one primary and one replica. And this is very fast because this is hard linking the files on the file system. That is why we needed to have one copy on the Elasticsearch 3 instance of every shard. So we could hard link them together. And from now on, you can just work uh, with this one uh, copy. The other operation, um, so the document is still there. The other operation is split. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying I want to create a split index with one shard, but I want to have a routing shard uh, or number of routing shards up to 20. And I can split into any number of or any factor of that. So let's create those. Um, if I um, insert a document, you have one primary, one replica shard. This is pretty much what you expect. You can block write operations. And then I basically say take the split index call the underscore split uh, API endpoint on that. I couldn't find a better name, unfortunately, but this is called split in five now. And I'll split this one shard into five primary shards, uh, which is also hard linking those. And then you can see, OK, now we have five primary and five replica shards again. You get the same data back. And if you run the underscore settings API on that one, it will actually tell you um, where uh, this data has been coming from and has been split out. OK, so we have covered those things. Um, the one thing I still wanted to mention, we're changing the default number of shards, because five is not a good number. You know, if I want to shrink, I need to split or shrink into a factor, and five is a prime number. So any prime number is not a very good choice. What do you think would be a good number of primary shards? And we've had this discussion for years internally. Any guesses? Or any guesses which number of shards we will pick? as a default for now. It will be one. Um, so one will be the new default, um, because well, we have seen too much oversharding. And also, um, someone says that use one index or one shard until it blows up. Um, I'm not sure if Simon is here, um, but ah, yeah, hi, Simon. Uh, yes, he will actually say that to you um, if you ask. Um, so yeah, we're getting there. Um, the other thing that we're adding, or probably do, this is still under discussion, we might do a JDK 11 minimum version for the upcoming set, 7. Um, question are, can users upgrade? And what versions of the Java client do we require then? Which will basically mean transport client is deprecated, so we don't care anymore. Um, the low-level client doesn't have an Elasticsearch dependency, so that can stay on 7, and we want to keep that on 7. For the high-level REST client to use the Elasticsearch 7 version, uh, you will need the JDK 11 as well there. You can still use the high-level client in version 6 and get all the features um, from 6. If you need the newer versions or newer features, you will need to fall, or fall back to the low-level client to actually run those queries. Uh, but that is what we had in mind. Um, this is pretty much it, and I think we're out of time. Um, if you haven't seen enough Elasticsearch stuff, we have a meetup here organized by the community. Uh, we will have one on Thursday. So if you want to dive more into search things, um, I will do some workshop style search thingy on Thursday. Even though I think it's pretty full by now, um, yeah, you might still get a space. Um, with that, do we have any questions? Oh, and before you run off, I always try to take a picture, um, normally so that I can prove to my colleagues that I've been working. I, I guess this is not necessary today. Smile, everybody. You may even wave. Awesome. Do we have time for questions? Oh, 
Uh, thank you, Philip, first. And uh, let's, let's take one short question, and then we'll uh, have a short break to get a, a continuation to the next talk. Is there a short question? I don't take questions from my coworkers. There's one here. Are you a coworker? <laughs> no, he's fine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, j just a quick question. You, you were talking about types and uh, like the fact that uh, it's changed and you have only one type and it's the underscore doc now. Uh, so what's, uh, what advice would you have for those that have indices that have more types? So what should they do and uh, will there be some helpers on top of Elastic to, to help migrating that? Yes, basically run the re-index uh, that I have shown. Um, where was it? Um, Something like this. I mean, this might be slightly simplistic, um, but this should give you the idea. Basically, take your old index with multiple types, play it into a new index uh, with one type, and then you probably need to change the ID if you have like shared IDs or overlapping IDs between the types. Remove the type underscore type field and set it to whatever you want, and probably keep that type information as a separate field if you need to keep that information. Something like this just through the replay, uh, re-index API. I hope that answers it. Thanks a lot. All right. Oh, let's thank the speaker again.